to the channel. My name is David Fleener. You can find out more about me at davidfleener.org. The topic of today's video is why I chose to get a PhD and how I found the right program for me. By the way, this is my puppy, Casper von Barklesby, who likes to sunbathe at this hour of the day. Hope you don't mind that he's there in the background. He doesn't have a PhD. For over 20 years, leaders in the field of healthcare chaplaincy have been saying that chaplains need to be research literate. And if we can go even further than that, that we could be competent to conduct research ourselves. Now, there's a couple of basic arguments for this. We work in healthcare. Healthcare uses data to make decisions, especially decisions about value. We don't have any data as chaplains, and that makes us vulnerable. Vulnerable to what? Loss of funding, and loss of funding means loss of positions. It even means that when we advocate for new positions, that we sometimes don't get them. In fact, oftentimes we don't. And why is that? Because we don't know how to speak the language of healthcare. The language of healthcare is data. Now, there's another argument, and that argument goes something like this. We value the work that we do. It's very important. We know patients, families, and staff value it. Now, wouldn't we want to do that to the best of our abilities? Yeah, of course. And in our training, what's naturally built in is reflective practice. That is, action reflection model in CPE. We go, we do ministry, we provide spiritual care, and then we reflect on it. And the ways that we reflect on it is within ourselves, with maybe a pastoral supervisor, clinical pastoral educator, uh, colleagues and a peer group. And we, as we do that, we refine our process and we go back and we try to do it better next time. Now that's a great process. And there's another way to do it. The argument goes that we should use data as part of our reflective process, not just our feelings, not just feedback from colleagues, peers, and friends, but actually collecting data analyzing it and finding out what's going on. Are we making a difference? We know we are, but how are we making that difference and to whom? And then we can take this information and we can improve our spiritual caregiving. About a decade ago, I found myself advocating for research-informed chaplaincy and evidence-based practice. And I was going around talking to people about this. I was sending messages on social media. I was really getting on the bandwagon. And then one day in a moment of reflection, I realized I wasn't practicing what I was preaching. I was an advocate, but I wasn't doing the hard work of reflecting through research. Well, the opportunity came for me to change my job and go to a very, very research heavy and research informed institution. And now over the past 10 years, I've been able to engage in research and publish about eight different peer reviewed articles. So part of my reflection was, I need to practice what I preach. And so I started to do it. So one of the first places to begin is our motivation. Are we motivated to engage in research? And that leads to a second question is, are we motivated to learn how to do research? It's not easy to do. And let's face the facts. Most of us come out of theological education programs where we learned how to do humanities research. Now, humanities research is great. We learned in seminary and rabbinical school and wherever we went, how to analyze a text, deconstruct it, break it open, interpret it on different levels and make meaning out of that. That's a great skill, but it's not the skill that healthcare administrators really care about. What they care about is data. Unless your undergraduate degree or a graduate degree that you've earned is from one of the sciences, meaning you've learned how to engage in scientific research, which is very different from humanities research, then it's an uphill battle. So for many of us, and this is certainly my story, the healthcare organization that I worked in was a place with a lot of expert researchers all around me. And so I was able to meet with them and start to get mentored and participate in very small ways in their research projects. And for so many of us, we're not gonna go back and get a degree, we're gonna just learn on the job. And that's great. That might even be the best way for some of us to learn. What I realized over my journey was that I had only reached a certain level 
of research capability. By being around truly expert researchers, I could see that I had some severe limitations. So I started looking at master's degrees in public health. And what I realized was that I already have two master's degrees. They're in theology. One's in divinity, which is pretty much the standard degree for healthcare chaplains. And the second one is a master's in sacred theology, which is a slightly advanced uh, graduate theological degree that I chose to focus on Anglican studies, specifically Anglican Christian spirituality, because I'm an Episcopal priest and that really matters to me. Neither of those two degrees, by the way, taught me anything about scientific research, and they weren't designed to do that. And while I was taking them, I wasn't exactly sure I was going to pursue chaplaincy as a profession anyway. So for me, I decided I wanted to look to the doctoral level to learn. So the first place I looked was the Doctor of Ministry degree. Now, there are lots of Doctor of Ministry degrees all across the country at accredited and respectable institutions. There are even a few that are popping up that are focused on chaplaincy. There's one on chaplaincy research. Most of them, though, are in the area of pastoral care and counseling, pastoral theology, as it relates to being a chaplain. That degree didn't fit for me because my purpose in seeking out a degree really was to learn how to do research. And it turns out there's already a degree that's geared towards that. And that's the PhD, the Doctor of Philosophy degree. One of the advantages of the PhD is that it's also easily recognizable across all fields. So I narrowed it down. I went from an MPH to a DMIN to a PhD and decided I'm gonna get a PhD. Now, next question, which PhD? There are tons of PhD programs all around the country. So I started looking at practical theology degrees. One of the things I had to consider is that I work full time and I have a family. So my life is very, very busy. So I wanted to look at distance-based degrees. Fortunately, we're in an era where online degrees are prevalent. But the first place I looked was over in Scotland because the European PhD degrees are much more self-paced. They're not based on classes and accumulating credit hours like the American PhDs are. The downside to that, and one of the reasons why I ultimately decided not to pursue a PhD in practical theology in a European institution is because I wasn't sure I could sustain the motivation all on my own to proceed through it at a good pace like I wanted to do. Another reason why I decided against the PhD in practical theology is because it's a theological degree. As I said, all of my education up to this point has been theological and in ministry. And I wanted to diversify and I wanted to learn scientific research. The specific PhD program in practical theology that I looked at focused on qualitative research, but did not have a sufficient component in quantitative research. Both of those are very important. And if you work in healthcare, you know that healthcare leaders really prefer quantitative data over qualitative data. So that's an important factor to consider. So I kept searching. I went on Google and I searched PhD spiritual care, PhD chaplaincy, and really wasn't finding anything. It was in a telephone conversation with George Fichet, who he suggested I look at PhD programs in nursing. He had talked to a nurse leader, an academic nurse leader recently, and she had said that the PhD in nursing is seeking non-nurses to engage the degree. So I took a look at it and I could see that it had some interesting course, but as the name implies, it was really nursing heavy and I'm not a nurse. So I kept looking around the website of this particular university and finally found a PhD in health sciences. And that's the degree that I decided to pursue and I'm about halfway through that program right now. There are lots of schools around the United States that offer a PhD in health sciences. It seems to be a degree that's emerged really over the last decade. And there are a lot of these programs that are offered online, which is great for somebody who's working full time. So I wanna tell you about the PhD in health sciences at Rush University, where I'm earning my PhD right now. Now, these degrees tend to focus on three areas of coursework. And I'm gonna give you the acronym REL because if you're watching this video, like me, you're into religion and health, spirituality and health, chaplaincy, CPE, so it's easy to remember REL because of the word religion. So these programs focus on research, education, and leadership. 
And what's great about these degrees is that they're really broad enough and able to be tailored to your specific learning needs related to your profession. So I study alongside of physical therapists, occupational therapists, dietitians and nutritionists, and other healthcare professionals. It's really a degree for allied health professionals. And I think of us as chaplains, as allied health professionals, in addition to being ministers. The coursework and research begins with an advanced biostatistics course, which was my most dreaded course. I have taken statistics in the past and I have not done well. I had no training and it's really hard and really scary for most of us. But I just took that course this summer and the professor was fantastic. What was genius about this is the online learning format. She would post her lecture every week as a video and I could listen to it at 1.5 times the speed. So I could get through it really quickly, but I could keep going back. I ended up watching those lectures probably three, four, five times because each week there was a quiz based on the lecture. And these weren't easy quizzes. You really had to understand the lecture material. But here's what made the difference is that this professor would meet with each student individually each week if you requested it. So not only did you have uh, a professor with great lectures and a great textbook, but you had the professor as your tutor. So I got through this course, thank God I made an A, and now I know a little bit more about biostatistics. Now I'm currently taking a course called Research Process One, which is focused on quantitative research. Next semester, I'll take Research Process Two, which is focused on mixed methods, so quantitative and qualitative research. After that, in the summer, I'll take Grantsmanship, which is a way to bring all of that together and, um, and focus it in the format of an NIH grant, which is a major source of funding for healthcare, of course. And then you move into your dissertation proposal. So that whole sequence is designed to help you develop your dissertation proposal over the course of a year, year and a half as you engage in these research courses. Now, the second group of classes is education. For those of us who are certified educators or clinical supervisors, we already bring a great deal of knowledge of adult learning to this degree program. So I've taken adult learning courses in this program. They've been fantastic, but as a certified educator, they've been a refresher. Now, if you're a chaplain and not, not an educator, this may be uh, new content to you. And trust me, it is a lot of fun to learn about adult learning theories. We're all adults. We're all engaged in learning, and it goes so much more smoothly when we know how it works and these theories work. And the third area is leadership. There are a number of leadership courses, leadership in higher education, leadership theory, and so on and so forth that you take in this degree program because people who go on to get PhDs become leaders in their fields. For me in the Rush PhD, I only have to go to Chicago where the campus is twice that's for qualifying exams after I've completed all the coursework, and then for the dissertation defense, which happens after I've completed the dissertation. I'm hoping to get all of this done in about five years. In this program, there's a seven year time limit, so you have to do it. So I'm excited about it. I'm already proceeding through it, and it's going really well, and I'm happy. So let's talk about the cost of the PhD program. So Russia's PhD in health science program cost about $3,000 per course. I think the credit hour charge is 900, 950. Every year I've been in the program, it's increased slightly, I think around 10%. So $3,000 per course. I only take about three courses per year. So I take one course per semester. We have a fall, a spring, and a summer semester. And that's about all I can handle given my workload and my family responsibilities. And it's a good pace for me. Now, how do I pay for that? Well, one course a year is basically paid by my institution from our tuition reimbursement program. If you decide to pursue an advanced degree, I recommend you look into your tuition reimbursement program from your employer. It's just money sitting there. Every year I get $2,400 of tuition reimbursement. Again, that pays for about one course. Over the rest of the months of the year, I save a little bit each month, and then I'm able to have enough each semester to pay the course myself. How many hours per week do you have to put into this program to be successful? You know, it really varies. It varies based on the class and the requirements. I put in so much time in advanced biostatistics. 
it was really intensive and I really needed to study and learn. So it depends on the course, depends on your knowledge. But here's the thing. I mean, I've been in chaplaincy and spiritual care for about 20 years now. And I'm able through this degree to tailor every one of my papers to spirituality and health. In fact, most of what I post on my website, davidfleener.org, comes out of the class assignments that I've done over the last couple of years. Another question I often get is how hard was it to get in? Well, in this particular program, I had to write an application, as you would imagine. I had to write an essay. I had to submit my transcripts. And there was also a requirement that I submit a GRE score. Now, the program director told me that this was an accreditation requirement and um, he would make sure that we fulfilled that but he gave me an option to having to take the GRE, which I didn't wanna do. I took the GRE years ago, probably 20 years ago to get into a PhD in medical sociology, which after taking statistics, I promptly dropped out of. So um, he said, if you can find evidence that you have taken the GRE before and that you got into a program, then I'll accept that and you don't have to take the GRE. I was able to get that paperwork, submitted it, didn't have to take the GRE, and then got accepted. Now, one of the things I didn't mention is that prior to getting into Rush's program, I had taken courses as a non-degree seeking student at the University of South Dakota's PhD in Health Sciences, which is incredibly inexpensive. It's about half the cost of Rush's. It's about 450 or $400 a credit hour, super inexpensive and really a high quality. I was able to transfer those two classes into Rush's program and in the process learn about two different programs. Rush's program requires that you have an on-site research mentor and the program director has a phone conversation with that person to make sure that that person is going to be supportive of you, has the expertise that's needed to support you in all of this, to see you through the completion of your dissertation. If you're interested in these programs, I'll put a link in the description below. I would also encourage you to just simply do a Google search of PhD Health Sciences and see what you find. Okay, so that's how I chose to pursue a PhD program and how I chose the right program for me. If you're thinking about getting a PhD or a doctor of ministry or any other advanced degree, I hope this video has been helpful to you. It's a journey, it's a discernment process to determine what's right, taking into consideration the content of the degree, the cost of the degree, and the commitment that you have to pursuing this degree. Everybody knows that it takes a lot of time and investment to complete an advanced degree. Okay, until next time. I'm David Fleener. You can find out more about me at davidfleener.org. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel. I'll be producing a video probably about every week and hope you come back and I'll see you next time. Okay. Hi, buddy. Hey, buddy.